Good morning, First Baptist Church. My name is Anthony. I'm one of the pastors here, if we haven't met. Good morning, Paul. Um, let me just read this passage of scripture over you to call us into a, a state of worship this morning. Psalm 84. How lovely is your tab tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Let us stand and rejoice together in the presence of God. Would you stand and sing with us? so glad that you're here with us. Won't you remain standing for our responsive reading? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Sing praises to the Lord, you his godly ones. Be glad in the Lord, you his righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Give thanks to the God of gods, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Amen. Won't you join me in a word of prayer? Dear God, we are thankful this morning that you have brought us together. We give thanks and praise for who you are and for all that you have done. God, we pray that you would help us this week of thanksgiving to truly give thanks, to count our blessings, to name them one by one. God, we are grateful to be here together. We are grateful that we have all received the invitation to your table. It is an invitation into your kingdom. And God, I pray that you would help us all to know today that we are welcome at your table. We are welcome in your house. God, we thank you for the many blessings that we have, for food to eat, for clean water to drink, for a roof over our heads, if we are so blessed. God, help us to roll out the red carpet, so to speak, to welcome those who are new to this church, who are new to this community. May they experience your welcome. May they experience your love. And God, we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught us, and we think about you as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Won't you stand with us as we sing our next hymn? seat. At this point in our service, as we give thanks to God for his many blessings, we have the opportunity to give out of gratitude in our hearts. And if you're a guest with us today, you are no, under no compulsion to give. We're just glad that you're here. But this is one of the ways in which we worship our God. Won't you join me as we pray together for the offering that will be received? Gracious God, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have each and every day to worship you. Romans 12 one reminds us that we are to offer our very lives as a living sacrifice to you. Worship is not just something that happens on Sunday mornings. It's not just something that happens in a church building, but it is something that should happen for us each and every day. There are so many ways that we can worship you, so many ways that we can give thanks. Lord, as the offering plates are passed, I pray that you would help us to worship through our giving. Lord, I pray that you would use the gifts to be a blessing in this community, to build this church family up, and help First Baptist Church to be a light here in downtown Portland. We are so grateful and so thankful for the many ways in which you have provided for us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Venga. have a seat. Let's pray one more time. God, we are so grateful again to be in your presence. We thank you for that song which has reminded us of the importance to always be thankful, no matter what we go through in our lives. God, today our theme is the idea that we are welcome at your table. And so, God, as we continue in our time of worship, we proclaim that we are thankful for just that, that we are welcome at your table. And so, God, I pray that as we look at your word in these moments, that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, and that you would prepare our hearts for the rest of today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you for our morning meditation to turn in your scripture to Luke chapter 14. You're going to want to keep uh, that part of your Bible available because we're going to revisit this passage a little later in the celebration service. And for those who are new to First Baptist, our worship is uh, broken into two parts. We do a classical service uh, from 10.30 to about 11, and then we go into our celebration service at about 11 o'clock. Um, so if you are wondering about the structure of our service, that's how we do things. Uh, we're going to look at verse 21 in Luke 14. Again, that's Luke 14, verse 21. And this is a passage of Scripture, and I'll read it in just a moment, but it is a passage of Scripture that's known as the parable of the great banquet. And here it is, um, and it starts at verse 15, which we'll look at in a little bit. But here Jesus gives us some very challenging thoughts. Thoughts for when it comes to an idea of what you might call radical hospitality. According to Luke 14, verse 21, once those who were invited to a feast came up with excuses as to why they could not come, the banquet host extended the invitation. And here's what he said. He said, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Verse 22, the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. You see, the host extended the invitation far beyond his original list to include those who were on the margins of society. Jesus' listeners, those who were listening as he shared this parable, would not have been surprised by anything that he has said up to this point in his message, even though it was regrettable that those that the host originally invited did not show up for the feast, this was something that could possibly happen in everyday life, even back then. However, what would have surprised and even scandalized people back then was what Jesus said next. Rather than invite replacement guests for the feast from the same social class, the host extended the invitation to the lower class, to people from the streets, as Jesus says, to the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Why was this such a surprise? Because when one of the dinner guests said, back in verse 15, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God, he was probably envisioning a table filled with people similar to him, who looked like him, who were from the same class, who were from the same clique. But that was certainly not the picture Jesus was painting. Instead, it was the very outcasts of society who would be welcome at God's table. This would have been a serious wake-up call, and it should be for us as well. Are we like that man? Are we so comfortable in our own salvation if we consider ourselves Christians? Are we so comfortable 
And we figure that we have gotten our act together so much that we have become just a bunch of stodgy religious people sitting around the dinner table talking about the good old days? Or are we willing to go out into the streets and alleys of this city and even to the surrounding countryside inviting all people to God's table, especially those that Jesus refers to as the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame? But don't you realize that that is exactly what today is all about? This day on which we all have been given the opportunity to invite and make all sorts of different people from our community feel welcome at the table. It should be no surprise to us that Jesus went to these particular sorts of people for that second guest list. Because Jesus always had a special concern for people in need. Amen? After all, remember what the scroll of Isaiah said about Jesus in Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus came to do. Amen? That is the sort of ministry He came for. That's what we should be about. What happens when a group of people who are in need are invited to a feast? Well, they often will show up. Amen? They don't make excuses. They just show up. Because listen, when you don't have a lot, There's not a lot to distract you from God. Amen? So the host extended his invitation beyond the original target audience. And this makes sense when you think about Jesus' ministry. His was outwardly focused ministry, calling the outsiders in society to come into the kingdom of God. Later on, Jesus' disciples would continue this outwardly focused ministry. It would cause the early church to grow. And you know what? We too were outsiders once. Not long ago, we were literal outsiders to this building. We all entered this building through one of these doors. But we too, even those of us who are members of First Baptist Church, were outsiders. But we're called, because of that, to be outwardly focused, to get beyond the walls of this building, after lunch, of course, to demonstrate the love of God to the people in our lives, to build bridges for the gospel, to share Jesus with people. Amen? It's sort of like the lunchroom in my middle school growing up. How many of you remember middle school? For some of us, that was a long time ago, but I'll tell you what, I remember it. I remember middle school. Do you remember the awkwardness of middle school? Anybody? Do you remember the awkwardness, especially of the lunch hour? Anybody? Oh, man. That was a terrible time of day. There there was a table for each of the various cliques. Everyone from the cool kids to the uncool kids to the dorks to the outcasts and untouchables of middle school society. They were all there. You see, we like to stay, church family, in our cliques, don't we? We do it these days just as much as they did in ancient times. But imagine what it would be like if the dorks, if the outcasts were made to feel welcome at the cool kids' table. Imagine the impact it would have on their lives if one of the cool kids invited them over to their table, making them feel welcome and valued. I venture to say that it could change their world. But that's the very kind of outwardly focused attitude we all should have. We must be willing to venture over to the other tables in the lunchroom of life to tell them that they are welcome at God's table. Amen? Amen. Today, as we celebrate Thanksgiving together, the question for us all is this. Will we be outwardly focused? I know it's not always easy. We, We all have our comfort zones. Lord knows I have mine. Some of us are introverts, and that makes it even more difficult. But today I want to challenge all of us. Will we get out of our comfort zones even just a little bit, introducing ourselves 
to somebody here at church, perhaps we don't know that well, you're going to have a chance actually to do that in just a few minutes. Maybe even inviting that person or somebody you're yet to meet later in the day to your table if you join us for the meal after the service. Will we, in the spirit of the parable of the great banquet, invite people that we don't know, people that are different from us, to join us at our table as we break bread together? Will we do it? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have today to give thanks, to celebrate, to have a great meal, but Lord, also to be challenged. Because when we gather together for a time of hospitality, Lord, we are also challenged to reflect the sort of hospitality that you speak about in Scripture. We refer to it as the very Word of God. And so may we take it seriously. May we be encouraged. May every single person here, especially the ones I look out there and I don't really know who they are. I don't know why they're here, Lord. But may they especially feel welcome today. May they experience your love. Lord, help us, though we are an imperfect bunch of people here at First Baptist Church, to extend a welcome, to shake a hand, to just make sure that every person here knows that they are welcome at God's table. It's in your name that we pray and give you thanks today. Amen. Pastor Sam. Good morning, church. Some wonderful faces today. Not that uh, we don't have uh, those all week, but... I see wonderful faces all the time, and it is so good to see you all. We're celebrating Thanksgiving Sunday this Sunday, so as you can see, all the, the decorations match that. We also have uh, some really matching good food. We don't have pineapples, though, but we do have some wonderful uh, food downstairs. So I invite you all to join together in the breaking of bread, even though it is not technically a communion service, but communion service is breaking of bread. So we'll be doing that, sharing a meal together. So you're all welcome for the lunch or Thanksgiving dinner, whatever it is called, meal right after the service. We also have an exciting Christmas event coming up, and I want to actually let you know that you are welcome, and you're welcome to bring as many friends as you can. And uh, I really hope that this will become a great tradition for our church every year. So Christmas celebration on Friday, December the 1st, at 6 p.m., right here in our sanctuary. And First Baptist Church of Portland, that is us, we, will be hosting this awesome Christmas carols and celebration of Christmas with wonderful songs and great things. On that evening, some of our fellow churches in the Portland, greater Portland area will be joining us together, and they will be doing some, some songs as well. And this will be a wonderful time. And as we go on, I think um, this year is, is going to be the first year for it, and the following years will be even more better. So make sure you come in and celebrate together. We also have um, our angel tree Angel Tree will be up next week, and if you're looking forward for it, that will be the time where you can take an angel from the tree and support um, the program there and um, get some gifts for the kids that are in need. And then we have Christmas Crafts Day and Pizza Party on Sunday the, the 3rd of December at 12 uh, or 12.15, right after service. So we will have a Christmas craft day. And um, we also have uh, our community Advent celebration on 17th of December. And that'll be our regular worship service, but it'll be a special Advent worship service. We also have our Christmas Eve service on Sunday the 24th. So make sure you come in for that. Last year I remember that it snowed. 
And so make sure that you take out your snow boots and, and all your snow clothing and stuff like that. I'm telling myself because it was not something. Everybody said it'll be a nice, beautiful, clear sky Christmas and it started snowing. And uh, also, please connect with life groups in our church. Life groups is one of the ways to get back to life. Because we pray, one of the life groups that, uh, that we do here is we do prayer Tuesdays at 11, and then Wednesdays at 7. Um, this week, we will not have the life group on Wednesday, which usually happens off-site on the east and west side of Portland in our partner uh, ABC campuses. But this week, we will not have it, but the, the next week, we will have it. And this is usually the time of the service where, uh, you know, I would probably say, get up and greet one another and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to say that today because we will have that time of fellowship during our meal. And you'll have enough time to shake people's hand and say hello and all that stuff. So we're going to go into blessings and welcome. And I already welcomed you. But I'm going to do the blessings since I, I missed my part uh, this service. So I'm going to invite you to join in a blessing, and it is really wonderful to see and uh, what the Lord gave me as a word today, and that is what I heard from Pastor Matt today. I was actually going to pray that prayer before Pastor Matt, but I actually showed it to Pastor Trudy, and, and so I still wanted to bless you with that word. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness. You're such an awesome God. And I pray blessing upon your people here in the sanctuary and those that are listening online. And I pray for your spirit, O oh Lord, to come upon us. Because your spirit brings the anointing to us. To give sight to the blind. To heal the brokenhearted. To set the captives free and to bring the good news to all people. So, Father, let your people here and those listening become those that receive this blessing so that we can do these things to the rest of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with us, if you like, as we continue our service of worship. And you're welcome to sit. You're welcome to do whatever you want as we worship together. This is a new, old song. See if you recognize it. You may have sung it here before. I don't know. So. Lifting gratitude and 
because of his love, and we will continue to worship to his name. One, two, three, four, five, six.
You may be seated. Good morning. I'll be reading Luke chapter 15, verse 4, 15 to 25 in Khmer. បាទសូមជំនាញទួរក្រុមជំនុំអាទាំងអស់ខ្ញុំនឹងរៀបខ្ញុំនឹងអានៅព្រះកំពីលូកាចំពោះទី 14 ខ Mean Borahmanet, Yum banting go pram num. Yum trow, the low via mull, som oi of log otto. Manet theatre, yum turb nung rip car propon high. Now he had no ban jig yum turb and ban. Bow no cot or lap the wing. Jum rip jawai cluon tam dom now no. Lochne, log prap the bow, tank of hung tar. Joe pronyap chang turb, I plow toad. Tom no tikrong. Or non put mono craw, pick a quack nun knout, jol mock or chap. Bow no, got him ripped her. Look, car dialogue bunk up no, bant for howie. Tie no tie mean no sulk and line tit. Rich a wide, bant rapped her. Joe chain to tamp low chirol a hot, tam rock bong. How it bunk hum or gay jol mock. Damn by our tear. บ้านปิ่งพอบ้านอัญบ้านปิ่งตบัดอัญปรับทาไอ้พวกมนุษย์เตียงปนมานได้อัญบ้านอัญเชิญหมอกมนุษย์อัญเลงเอาเนี่
and um, some folks who speak Spanish, and so we will read the scripture in Espanol as well. But before we do that, I do want to let people know as well that Kid Church is about to begin. If you have a child up through fifth grade, follow that wonderful lady right there. Her name is Lisa. I happen to know her pretty well, um, and uh, there will be programming for kids downstairs. Uh, uh, we, once again, uh, vamos a leer la escritura en español. We're going to read the scripture in Spanish. Al oír esto, uno de los que estaban sentados en la mesa con Jesús le dijo, Dichoso el que coma en el banquete del reino de Dios. Jesús contestó, Cierto hombre preparó un gran banquete e invitó a muchas personas. A la hora del banquete mandó a su siervo a decirles a los invitados, Vengan porque ya todo está listo. Pero todos, sin excepción, comenzaron a disculparse. El primero dijo, acabo de comprar un terreno y tengo que ir a verlo. Te ruego que me disculpes. Otro indicó, acabo de comprar cinco yuntas de bueyes y voy a probarlas. Te ruego que me disculpes. Y otro alegó, acabo de casarme y por eso no puedo ir. El siervo regresó y le informó de esto a su señor. Entonces el dueño de la casa se enojó y ordenó a su siervo, sal de prisa por las plazas y los callejones del pueblo y trae acá a los pobres, a los lisiados, a los ciegos y a los cojos. Señor, dijo luego el siervo, ya hice lo que usted me mandó, pero todavía hay lugar. Entonces el señor respondió, Ve por todos los caminos y las veredas y oblígalos a entrar para que se llena mi casa. Les digo que ninguno de aquellos invitados disfrutará de mi banquete. Lucas capítulo 14, versículo 15 a 24. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear God, once again, we come before you with hearts full of thanksgiving and praise. We ask, Lord, that as we study this scripture and as we think about what it means to be invited to a big meal, what that illustration is all about, that you would help us to know that you are inviting us to your table, to your kingdom. We are thankful that we can be together in this house with all sorts of different people. Lord, with brothers and sisters in Christ, with people who are totally new, people who have never even been to First Baptist Church, we're just glad to be together. We're glad to be in your house. And we are thankful for this very moment. Te damos gracias, Señor, que tenemos ahora la oportunidad de estudiar tu palabra juntos. En el nombre de Cristo, nuestro Salvador. Amen. Well, my friends, I don't know about you, but I love Thanksgiving. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Anybody else love Thanksgiving? Let's hear a round of applause for Thanksgiving. All right. It's so good. And I think that the food is almost done downstairs. I have smelled it, and I think it's going to be amazing. So um, I will try not to talk too long today, okay? Don't hold me to that. But anyway, I love Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. And sometimes I get flack for saying that because people have this in their mind that pastors should prefer Christmas or Easter. Doesn't that seem more appropriate? But there are several reasons why I put Thanksgiving at the top of the list. First of all, it's less commercialized than some of those other bigger holidays. Instead, Thanksgiving is truly about family, fellowship, and of course, the food. Amen? There's turkey. There's ham if you don't like turkey. There's my wife's garlic mashed potatoes, my grandmother's famous sausage dressing recipe. She had one for oysters too, not necessarily my favorite, but people who like oysters like it. There's cranberry sauce. There's my Aunt Peggy's famous deviled eggs. Anybody like deviled eggs? Oh, man, there's enough black olives for one for each of ten fingers if you got them. And, of course, the most important part, homemade, from scratch, pumpkin pie. And let me just tell you something right now. People will tell me, oh, and I'm going to name the name of a store, deal with it. They'll tell me, oh, that Costco pumpkin pie is just as good. No, it ain't. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. It's got to, you got to boil that pumpkin down. You got to bake that pumpkin yourself. And that is how you get a pumpkin pie, my friends. But then, but then there is also what I would call the cultural significance of Thanksgiving. I want to talk to you about that. You see, I learned to appreciate that part of Thanksgiving back in 2001 when I was a student and I lived in Spain. 
It was my first and only Thanksgiving spent outside of the United States. I've never done that since. I had been there for about three months, and I had gained an appreciation for the culture of that part of the world, all sorts of different people that I came into contact with. And to me, Spanish culture was so rich, it was so diverse, it was so cool, like the different traditions and the things that they had going on. And I started to think that my own culture was a little, well, boring, to be quite honest. It just seemed like we Americans didn't have a lot to offer in comparison with the great diversity of festivals, of music, food in Spain. But then, came Thanksgiving. And I was over there with about 30 other Americans, and we all decided that we couldn't go without celebrating Thanksgiving. So we decided to rent space, and guess where we rented it? We had to go to a bar, folks. That's what was available to us. And we rented this bar, we rented this pub, and we had Thanksgiving. And we had to plan it out. Each one of us had to sign up to bring something. And I tell you what, it was quite a challenge to track down some of these foods. Do you realize that? We take it for granted, but you don't find turkey everywhere. You don't find cranberries all over the world. You don't find pumpkin all over the place, certainly not in a can. That's where I learned how to boil that thing down on my own, by the way, because I had no choice. But we did it. And so we had this amazing Thanksgiving feast. And we invited all of our international friends from the university. Well, there were Italians there, there were French there, there were Germans, British, and of course there were Spaniards. And it was in that context that I felt truly proud to be an American. I felt proud of my culture, of what it meant to come from the United States, that we were able to share that with other people because, you see, everybody was welcome at the table in that seedy bar that we were able to rent. And I will never forget that Thanksgiving experience. Thanksgiving is all about making people feel welcome at the table. After the service today, as you know, we've been talking about it, all of us will literally be welcome at the table downstairs when we enjoy a very similar Thanksgiving meal together. The pies may have come to, from Costco. I don't know, okay? So, <laughs> disclaimer, they are good pies. Don't get me wrong. And if you need something to be thankful for this year, though, if you're coming here today and you're like, my life is kind of a mess, but if you need something to be thankful for today, there is something, and this is it. It's what today's scripture is all about. It's the big idea. It's in your notes. It's going to be on the screen. This idea that you are welcome at God's table. Tú eres bienvenido en la mesa del Señor. Amen? If you were with us last week, you may remember that this was the big idea then as well. It's a very important theme that emerges from this whole section of Luke's gospel. You may recall that Luke 14 ties back to Luke 13. No surprise there verses 22 through 30, where Jesus taught that the door into God's kingdom is actually narrow. And like there, here in verse 14, Jesus is challenging assumptions. Don't, don't you know that Jesus does that all the time? Jesus is always challenging our assumptions. And here in Luke 14, Jesus is challenging the assumption of some people that they would automatically enter the kingdom of God and inherit eternal life simply by virtue of their ethnicity, their social class, their family, their good deeds. But let me tell you something. Entrance into the kingdom of God wasn't about those things. No. It was about accepting an invitation. Everybody say the word invitation. Invitation. There's an invitation. It is core to what we are talking about today. The passage that we're looking at is also the dramatic conclusion of a Sabbath day meal that Jesus was sharing in the home of some Pharisees. Last week we talked about how at this meal in Luke 14, 1 through 14, Jesus had settled several matters once and for all. First of all, he settled the matter that it was okay to heal on the Sabbath. Second, that his followers must be willing to yield their seat of honor to others, something for us to keep in mind today when we're downstairs sharing a meal together. And third, that they also should show hospitality to those who had no way at all of paying them back. And in today's passage, he goes even deeper, responding to what I would call a very spiritual-sounding 
statement that is made by one of the guests that was present at the feast that day. Let's see what that comment was, shall we? If you are not there already, I told you to be there earlier if you were with us, but turn to Luke 14, okay? Make sure you're in Luke 14. But I want you to go to Luke 14, and I want you to see what this says. There's this guy who makes this comment, and it sounds, sounds really good. It sounds really good. And before I read it, what I want to say to you is this, that maybe all this tough talk from Jesus was making some of his guests, or some of the guests there, very uncomfortable. And so this person stands up, and he tries to change the subject, and here's what he says in verse 15. He says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Doesn't that sound nice? With all the controversial stuff that Jesus had been saying, surely everyone would agree with this positive statement and it would distract them all enough to go on enjoying their meal and their status quo. But instead, Jesus used this comment as a setting to talk about something very important. He brings up a very serious point that many of those in that very room, did you catch it at the end? of the passage, that many of those would not be present at God's table. And it's not that they would not be there because they had not been invited. They had been invited. No, they would not be there because they did not respond to the invitation. They were taking for granted that they would automatically be in God's kingdom by virtue of their status and good deeds. But Jesus is telling them not to count their chickens before they hatch. There's a saying that being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Amen? Amen. So Jesus tells them a parable to get the point across. And in the parable, there was a host who was preparing a banquet for his guests, similar to what the folks downstairs are doing right now in this moment. And five things happen in what is known as the parable of the great banquet. First of all, number one, the host invited many guests He invited all sorts of people. It it would have been near evening time, as this was the main meal of the day. And it would have been no small family get-together. It was truly a significant feast. It was a celebration. And, And you see, there was an ancient custom to send out a servant with invitations ahead of time, requesting people to RSVP. Then those invited would generally accept the invitation. They would send word back to the host who would prepare this incredible feast based on who accepted. Then once the feast was actually ready to be enjoyed, the servant, like an alarm clock, would be sent out to let the guests know that it was time to come on over. Well, these days we have a similar process, don't we? You can even use social media to ask people to RSVP. You can prepare for your event, whatever it is, based on the number of people who respond. Then on Facebook, for example, alerts will come up for your guests to remind them it's time for dinner. And this is exactly what Jesus had been doing among the people of his day. Think about it. He was letting them know that the feast was ready, that the kingdom of God was at hand that it was time for them to actually respond to the invitation. And the servant said to his guests, or to the guests, he said, come, for everything is ready now. You see, my friends, God's kingdom is not just some distant, far-off concept for after you die. Granted, there is a very important future aspect to the kingdom of God, but it is also here and now. And the invitation to come to God's table is extended in this moment. The implication for you and for me is to not delay our response. Amen? Quit making excuses. Respond to the invitation now. The second big thing that happens in the parable is this, that those invited gave excuses for not attending. How many of you have given excuses before? I give excuses all the time for various things. Don't ask me what and don't ask me when. But we do it. In fact, in a strange turn of events, verse 18 says that all the guests, not just some of them, not just three, by the way, but all the guests began making excuses. Did you catch that? Some people read this and they think, well, there were just three people who who turned them down. No, all the guests. 
And as it would turn out, not a single one of them would end up attending the feast, despite the invitation. Three excuses were given, but this does not mean that there were only three people. Many were invited. Now, people, the people giving excuses, we need to say this, these were well-to-do people. Did you catch that? Did you think about that? These were well-to-do people. They had some money. They had some means in that society. The first person was involved in a real estate transaction. Ernest, you know all about that. It takes some money to get involved in a real estate transaction. Amen? The second person was involved in purchasing not one, not two, but five yoke of oxen. That's ten. These were wealthy people. These were people of means. Normally, you would only have one or two yoke of oxen if you were a landowner in that day. So these were people who had some stuff. Now, for all the husbands out there, I want to caution you about the third excuse that is given in verse 20. You can look at it if you like. You see, the third person, the third guy, said that he couldn't go to the feast because he needed to stay home with his new wife. <laughs> How many of you have ever blamed something on your wife before, right? He had to stay home with his wife. Now listen, though, listen. In the Old Testament, there were allowances made for men to be freed from certain obligations, including military service, when they were newly married. That was a law. You can look it up. Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. And this makes sense because of the old saying, and it must be really old because maybe it was around back then. I don't know for sure. We'd have to fact check that. But there's the old saying that, that is, if, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? And in 1 Corinthians 7, 33, it says this, that a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. But in the parable... There was really no reason that this man could not attend the friend's feast. After all, he had already sent in an RSVP that he would be there. He could have brought her along, right? You see, this guy was just flaking out. He was blaming his wife. And, and trust me, it is never a good idea to blame stuff on your wife or on your spouse when you're the one flaking out. Amen? I better hear an amen. Don't do it. Trust me. So what about you? Do you have priorities in your life that sometimes get in the way of what matters most? Well, of course you do. <laughs> we all do. So then, what are those priorities that compete against God's invitation to you? The very thing that matters most of all in this life. Sure, it's easy to choose the invitation to God's table when all you have to eat at home is ramen noodle soup or peanut butter and jelly. But what about when you got steak on the grill? What about when you got a warm apple pie? What priorities, what important things, what good things compete against God's invitation to you? Amen. Is it an economic priority, as it was for the first two guys in this parable? Your career, your house, your hobbies, your toys? Is it a relationship priority, as it was for the third guy in the parable? Sometimes in your life, there's somebody who for some reason is hindering you from following Jesus wholeheartedly. These are important priorities, career, spouse, etc. But if you're not careful, they can become a dangerous trap. You may even have a desire to come to God's table, to live a life committed to Jesus, but these things trap you and hinder you on your way. But the good news is that God's grace is still there for you. The invitation still stands. The question is this, will you respond? Now, I bet you there's many of you out there, lots of you, most of you, I would hope all of you even, who have already responded, but in a group this size, there's always somebody who hasn't responded yet. The challenge is not to respond to God's call when you got nothing better to do. Instead, the challenge is to realize that responding to God's call is the most important priority that you will ever have. Amen? The third thing that happens in the parable is that the host became angry. Did you catch that? The host became a little ticked off, a little peeved, right? And we think about it and it's like, man, 
What's that saying about God? What is going on there? That is the emotion that the host experiences when he discovers that none, zero, zipperuni, of those that he initially invited will be coming to dinner. Anger. But why? Why? Well, think about it. Wouldn't you also be a little frustrated? Hmm? Wouldn't you be a little upset? You make all the arrangements for the feast, you buy the food, you've already sent the invitations, you've received the RSVPs, and then everybody flakes out. You see, here's the thing. When you invite somebody to an event like this, listen, guess what? That means you really actually want them there. Amen? It means that you really actually want them to be with you at the event. And, and don't you see what's going on here? That God really wants you to be with him. Amen? Somebody needs to hear that. God really wants you there. Amen? No matter what you've thought in the past, God has invited you because God wants you there. You are wanted. You are loved. You see, the host wanted his guests to attend, and so he is frustrated when they don't show up. Do you realize that God shows emotion when it comes to us? Did you realize that? In the Old Testament, and well, even today, you know, there are all these people, they had these idols. They were made of wood. They were made of stone. They were dead. They were nothing. But the God of the Bible is a God of emotions. The God of the Bible is a person. Amen? There is emotion. There is something that happens there in response to who we are and what we do. He desires for us to accept the invitation to enter the kingdom. Listen to what 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, everyone to come to repentance. You see, God desires us to change our priorities, to accept the invitation. And so it's not like God just shrugs his shoulders and says, oh, well, Neil's not going to come. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> You're welcome, by the way. You're welcome at the feast. It's not like God says, well, Sherry didn't show up even though the RSVP came in. Yeah. No, God is like, oh, I want Neil there. I want Sherry there. It's important to me. God is disappointed. It, it, it even makes him angry. And we don't like to think about that sometimes, but why does it make him angry? Because God loves you that much. Because God wants you to be at the table. Because God wants you in his kingdom. That's why Jesus went to the cross for you people. Amen? That's why he did it. It all boils down to the love and grace that God feels for you in particular. The fourth big thing that happens in the parable is that the host extended the invitation to, quote, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Those terms may sound a little old-fashioned in this day and age, but that's, that's what they are in the text here. Even after that happened, however, even after that invitation was extended, there was still room at the table according to verse 22. By the way, we've extended the invitation. There's a lot of people here I don't recognize. How many of you are here for the first time if you're brave enough to hold up your hand? I, I know there's several people out there, yeah. We're so glad that you're here. You're welcome. But even with these new people, guess what? Look around you. There's still space, amen? You see what I'm saying? And that's the situation that was going on when we get to number five, that the host expanded the invitation even more because there were still some empty seats he wanted to include people from the roads and the country lanes, invite in all the hicks and the hillbillies. Bring them on in. Now, this didn't mean other cities. It didn't mean other countries in this case, but rather the area surrounding his city, the countryside. It was the idea of really getting the word out to every part of that particular city and the surrounding area. It was a universal appeal to every single person who lived there, to every table in the middle school lunchroom, so to speak. It's a reminder that the gospel is God's word for everyone in every corner of this city, too. And despite the great disappointment of that first group of guests turning the host down, 
The end of verse 23 says that the feast will go on and that the house will be full. You see, there is no stopping God's work. There is no stopping God's kingdom. Now, let's remember, Jesus was hanging out with a bunch of Pharisees when he's saying all this stuff. Do you remember that? He's hanging out with a bunch of Pharisees, and, and what they needed to understand was to not take for granted that they would automatically end up in God's kingdom. Just because you looked like you had it all together on the outside, just because you were well-to-do and seemed to be experiencing God's blessing, just because you sat at the cool kids' table or even appeared religious, these things were no guarantee of your status with God. The only, listen, the only, the only thing that mattered was responding to the invitation to enter God's kingdom. It was a decision that carried with it eternal consequences. Now listen, it's important to point out that those in the parable who ended up not going to the meal, they did so by choice. Did you catch that? They did so by choice. It was not that they were unwelcome. No. It's not that the host didn't want them there. No. Once the hour of the feast came around, they simply chose not to go. It's right there. We make our own choice nowadays. A choice to either accept God's invitation or a choice to turn it down. A choice to believe in Jesus for the absolutely free gift of eternal life or to turn it down, to ignore him completely. My friends, you are welcome at God's table. So what? <laughs> Two things. One, respond to the invitation. It's right there. Just got to check going or not going. And you can put on there whether you want the fish or the chicken or the beef, you know, whatever. Joking. Respond to the invitation. It's the idea that nobody should take for granted their relationship with God. The gospel is not just for one elite crowd. The gospel is God's word for everyone. It is for people from every nation, tribe, and language. It's a reminder of what Jesus said back in Luke 13, verse 29. People will come, he says, from the east and the west, the north and the south. They will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. The parable talks about those who had been invited to the feast. This idea, by the way, comes from a Greek word, kaleo, which means to call, to invite, to summon. In this parable, the calling, the invitation, the summons is universal. It goes out to everyone, including the original guests, and eventually to the outcasts of the city and the countryside. To emphasize how far and wide the calling went out in Matthew's version of this, the word is used twice. You can look it up. Literally, the servants were to go out and call the called. They were to invite the invited. But it, despite this universal appeal, tragically, not everyone accepted the invitation. You and I, you and I are also called. We are also invited to respond to the gospel, to the invitation into God's kingdom. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Like the servant in the parable, God the Holy Spirit may be calling the called today. God may be inviting the invited today. He may be knocking at the door of your heart in this very moment. And if God is doing that, all you need to do is respond. Perhaps in this very moment. You are being called, you are being invited, you are being chosen for God's kingdom because you are loved, because you are valued. There's a reason why you're being invited. It's not cause for alarm. It's not cause to feel weird. It's cause for thanksgiving, amen? And so I plead with you, I, I literally plead with you to respond to the gracious invitation that has been personally extended to you. Secondly, invite others. Plain and simple, invite others. In the parable, the host sent his servant out. There's another Greek word here. It's apostello. It's where we get the word apostle from. It means sent one. 
the servant in the parable was a sent one. Do you realize that those of us who have already responded affirmatively to the invitation to God's table are also God's sent ones? And like the host in the parable, God sends us out to extend the invitation to his table to all we come into contact with. And just like Jesus used the feast he was at to illustrate concepts about the kingdom of God, today's Thanksgiving feast at First Baptist illustrates the same ideas. You see, just like in the parable, we too have invited all sorts of people to our feast. And we too had an RSVP list, actually, letting us know how many people to prepare for so that we could make the necessary preparations. And just like in the parable, there was the possibility that some of those who RSVP just plain wouldn't show up. And like it did for the host, this may cause frustration. After all, if a feast is prepared for your guests, don't you want them to show up and enjoy it? But most importantly, like the host in the parable, we have extended the invitation far and wide in the streets and alleys of our own city and the surrounding communities, not only for this special event, but the invitation to God's table, the invitation to believe in Christ for salvation, for eternal life that is freely offered. You see, that is why we were sent out to others, to invite them to God's table. My friend, I don't care who you are. I'm glad you're here. And even if you didn't RSVP, I don't care. Come and eat downstairs. There's going to be good food. We're glad. Because, listen, you are welcome at God's table. Amen. All right? Whether you're ready to respond to anything today or not, you are welcome. Say it. I am welcome. I am welcome. Amen. Amen. And so as we close this morning, as we reflect on this illustration of a feast, I want to set the tone for the actual feast that we will enjoy together. You're going to be at a table, hopefully with some people you don't know, okay? Hopefully we mix it up a little bit. Hopefully we get to know some new people. But I want you to, to think about that typical question that's always asked at Thanksgiving time. And that is, guess what? What are you thankful for, right? That's the question. What are you thankful for? Well, I'll tell you what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for my beautiful wife who's downstairs working with the kids, Lisa. I'm thankful for my children, Levi, Josh, Oscar, and Lucy. I'm thankful for the Thanksgiving meal that I will have the privilege of sharing with all of you gathered here in just a few moments. You can see not every church does Thanksgiving these days, but we do, and I am thankful for that. Amen? I don't need it, but I want as many Thanksgiving meals as I can get. Okay? I love it. But what I am most thankful for today is that Jesus made me feel welcome at God's table despite my imperfections, despite my sin, despite my challenges, which are many, but God has made me feel welcome there. He has invited all the imperfect people of our world to the table. That includes me, and that includes you as well. What are you thankful for? Why don't we start with that one? You are welcome at God's table. Let's pray. And as we pray, I would invite Pastor Sam forward and in case anybody during our last song would like to pray, would like to seek the Lord, would like to express a spiritual commitment, a first-time decision to believe in Jesus, to accept the invitation to God's table. He'll be up here to talk with you, to pray with you. If you just want prayer in general, you're more than welcome. But my friend, as you are there with our eyes closed, if you are hearing today for the first time, or, or perhaps you've heard it before, but you're just you're kind of like making the connections and understanding, okay, I really am welcome at God's table. I really am welcome in God's kingdom. It has nothing to do with where you came from. It has nothing to do with your family. It has nothing to do with what you have done or have not done has nothing to do with what the world says about you. It has everything to do with Jesus, though, who said that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Is today your day to believe in Jesus 
and to accept the free gift of eternal life. If it is, you can tell him. You can just say something like this. If you, if you need to put words to it, if you need help with that, you can just say, Dear God, in this moment, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me and rose again on the third day. I accept now the free gift of eternal life that you offer to me. Help me to live for you, but thank you, thank you that I am welcome at your table. Dear God, I pray for all of us today, those who have echoed those words in their hearts especially. I pray that you would help them to really know, really know in their hearts what it means to be welcome at your table. I thank you for dying for them. I thank you for rising again on the third day. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will help them to grow through the course of their lives. God, I pray for all of us that you would help us to give you thanks that we are welcome. And every day, not just this Thanksgiving time, but God, help us, Lord, to be people who would invite others. We are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be together, to worship, and to be reminded of your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to God and to that message and to the invitation he has given to us in a timely manner. If you'd like to stand and sing with us one more song. When the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day.
morning, everyone. Please bow down and pray with us for the uh, closing and the meal. Lord, as we bow down and pray, we celebrate Thanksgiving Day. Help us have the right attitude as we turn to you in gratitude. Thank you for our festive mode. Thank you, Lord, for this good food. Thank you for blessing great and small. Thank you, thank you for it all. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are all welcome to start making your way downstairs. The food has been blessed, but you're also invited to stay. We're going to play one more song, so you can uh, move about as the Lord leads you. You're invited. Secure. 